the, all the, on all the website. Do you mind if I just do a quick journey on the machine? Because yeah. it's just back at the hotel. I feel like yeah. I've got time to get back. Yeah, it's okay. actually perfect. So, it's perfect. Okay. Um, can I ask delegates who are, for some reason, perching themselves on the left-hand side of there to come down into the main auditorium, join your colleagues in the main section, just so we can be collegiate? Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, if you would take your seats as quickly as possible. We're about to begin um, our final section in what's been a really great second day of the conference. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Glenn Patterson. Glenn is the author of three works of nonfiction and 10 novels, most recently his 2016 novel, Gull. He is also uh, the co-writer of Good Vibrations with Colin Carberry for BBC Films, which the pair adapted for stage at the Lyric Theatre Belfast. In 2012, uh, The Mill for Grinding Old People Young was the choice for Belfast One City, One Book. And I think that tells you something about 
his place in the culture of this city and the power of his voice of um, and for uh, Belfast. Um, he has written plays for Radio 3 and Radio 4 and with composer Neil Martin, Glenn Patterson wrote, long story short, the Belfast Opera in 2016. He is now the director of the Seamus Heaney Centre at Queen's University Belfast. And I hope you'll give a very warm welcome to Glenn Patterson. Shit, arriving at the podium after the applause has ended. I should have got up there <laughs> faster. So we got the, the only problem with glasses is um, with these I can see that, um, but I can't see you. So um, I'm going to keep them on if if that's all right, you you lovely blurry people. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at the in the Waterfront Hall, um, which was our first major post ceasefire building on which it seemed uh, we expended all the glass we had been storing up throughout the 1970s <laughs> and the 1980s when all we built were bomb-proof shelters. Um, I, I say it's always a pleasure to be here. I am just a tiny bit disappointed that I'm not doing this in the Ulster Museum, which is home to my favourite sign in all of Belfast, men's toilets, and then just below that, window on the world. <laughs> uh, Paddy Gilmore tells me that I am the last act of this particular Museum Association conference before the torch is handed over to Brighton. Ladies and gentlemen, please accept my apologies. Um, I'm as close as you're going to get to Jimmy Page. <laughs> if you imagine me delivering this, not from a podium, but like Jimmy in Beijing from the top of a bus, uh, or rather a glider, one of our new bendy purple buses, of which, in case you hadn't noticed, we are greatly proud. I'd be amazed if you'd been here for two days and not had someone tell you that you really, really ought to try them. I'd be even more amazed if you'd been here for even half that time and not had someone, many ones, tell you about Belfast's proud history of democracy and dissent. You could probably by now recite to me the story of how half a dozen young men in the last decade of the 18th century met on Cave Hill overlooking the city or the town as it was then, and swore an oath to unite all the people of Ireland, Catholic, Protestant, that is to say, established church Protestant, and dissenter, which for Ireland then, and for Belfast in particular, was synonymous with Presbyterian. Religious and political dissent were, if not everywhere, intertwined, far from strange bedfellows then in this northeast corner of the island. The vow on Cave Hill is in more ways than one the pinnacle of our political history to date. The clearest, most succinct expression of a non-sectarian politics which still eludes us and the pursuit of which in the late 1790s for every peak here, alas, a trough ended in bloodshed and the very sectarian strife its architects tried to transcend. They did, though, succeed in leaving their stamp on the city in other ways. The Belfast Society for Promoting Knowledge, more commonly known as the Linen Hall Library, still flourishing 230 years after its foundation, is a product of that radical moment. Several of its founding members died in or were executed after the United Irish Rebellion of 1798. And though it's commonplace to say that the repression of that rebellion and the act of union that quickly followed focused the attention of dissenters thereafter on matters more spiritual than temporal, some of the openness to new ideas that characterized the previous generation is evident in the founding of Belfast's first museum in 1831. The guiding lights were again in the main young Presbyterian men but if any one individual represents the continuation of the spirit and ideals of the late 18th century into the 19th, it is Mary Ann McCracken, 
sister of Henry Joy McCracken, the Belfast United Irish leader, hanged outside the market house on the corner of High Street and Corn Market, where Dunn's Stores is today. The entrance of Dunn's Stores is even at the same slight diagonal to the street as the market house door was. Mary Ann McCracken turned 28 the week before her brother's execution. His body was handed over at the foot of the scaffold into her care. She survived him by almost 70 years, well into the era of photography. I've just kicked my water over. All, all over the electrics is what I'm saying. This could be, if this was the movie, there'd be like a little flame moving across <laughs> at this stage. And defiantly, I'd still be talking. Usually the way it goes is the highest paid person is the one who's going to survive if anything happens, so I'm running straight away. <laughs> Mary Ann McCracken was, and I'm thirsty as well, that's the other thing. I, I had left it thinking that was like the cleverest place to leave it. I also knocked one over beside my bed this morning, that's just... In fact, I've got to tell you this, the first words... The first words I said this morning when I got up was, you dick, to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so often do I say them, in fact, this is true. My wife told me that I woke up in the middle of the night once and just said, you dick, to myself. So, <laughs> whatever it was going on. Mary Ann McCracken, do you remember her? <laughs> Uh, do I should just stop? <laughs> just saw the screen that said Glenn Patterson, writer. Let's so, go back to that. <laughs> uh, to... Mary Ann McCracken was, in her very long lifetime, a campaigner against the causes and the effects of poverty, at one point lobbying the board of the poor house for candles sufficient unto the hours of darkness for the children who until then had been allowed the equivalent of only one hour a day, or rather night, even in the depths of winter. She took a keen interest in prison reform, care of the sick, and even, apparently, animal welfare. Her admiration for the nuns in Belfast's first convent being tempered only by her certainty that she could never keep to a vow of silence herself if, when out and about, she was unable to take the part of some poor, ill-used animal. A disapprover of strong drink and coarse language, she was also a lifelong opponent of slavery. She and her friends abstained from sugar while the slave trade was ongoing in the West Indies. Even after abolition throughout the British Empire, she continued one of only 16 or 17 people in Belfast, all women by her reckoning, to protest against, I guess, I guess that means 16 or seven people by her reckoning, all women, uh, rather than all women by her reckoning. <laughs> I'm reading that as though I, I wrote that. I should just... <laughs> One of only 16, seven. There were only 16 or 17 people, by her reckoning, all women, uh, <laughs> who were still protesting against the perpetuation of slavery elsewhere. To the image of half a dozen young men taking a vow on Cave Hill, I add, as the epitome of dissent Belfast style, Mary Ann McCracken, aged 89, standing at Belfast docks, handing anti-slavery leaflets to emigrants, boarding the ships that would take them to the United States. A decenter skin, as my father would have said, may never have walked the streets of Belfast. And I would be the world's worst liar if I said that hers was the version of dissent that I aspired to or even paid attention to when I was growing up. When I was growing up, though, dissent was something you got sent off the football field for. Sent off for dissent. Sent off for dissent. It's a perfect little capsule of a phrase, a phrase that seems to flirt with palindrome. Sent off 
four, and then, do you know what, it just can't be bothered with that symmetry shit. <laughs> I don't know whether you could call golden an age whose principal element appeared to be mud, but the 1970s seemed to specialize in players who combined sublime individual skill with long hair, untucked shirts, and constant mouthing off. Charlie George, Peter Marinello, Stanley Bowles, and the daddy of them all, of course, Belfast's own George Best. Now, before I say another word about George Best and discipline, I ought to mention that shortly after the turn of the millennium, do you remember that, when that was a thing, the turn of the millennium? Do you remember it was a really, really big thing? We all talked about the turn of the millennium. Shortly after 2001, I think they just now call it, just after the turn of the millennium. In 2001, Double Band Films here in Belfast made a documentary called George Best's Body, which featured a full-length portrait of Best in his footballing prime, wearing just a pair of shorts. The term kicked to pieces might have been coined for his legs. On the football pitch, at least, he was a man far more sinned against than sinning, but he was also, for a time, one of the most famous players on the planet, so when he sinned, on April the 18th, 1970, Northern Ireland played Scotland at Belfast's Windsor Park. I was eight years old, too young to go. It would be another year before I saw my first international, but my two elder brothers went with my dad. I remember running to them as they came in the back door. I only had two questions. How did we do? We lost. And how did Georgie play? My dad shook his head in disgust and despair. Georgie had been sent off for flinging mud at referee Eric Jennings, who, as if the offence needed to be made any starker, had been wearing a white shirt for the day. <laughs> to distinguish him in that black and white television world most of us still lived in from the dark shirts of Northern Ireland and even darker shirts of Scotland. Uh, luckily, in those days, being sent off was no bar to playing in the next game, which George did three days later against England and scored. We lost again, but he scored, so, you know, small victories. I say best was the daddy of them all, but my favorite image of that era is of a player, some of you might know him, called Robin Friday, playing for Cardiff City, wheeling away from the goalkeeper, Milia Alexic. He is left sitting in the mud after scoring a goal against Luton Town in the old second division. Now, I like football. But in the ordinary run of things, I don't, and certainly in the ordinary pre-internet run of things, living in Belfast, I didn't regularly encounter photographs of English second division matches. I only know this image because it was used on the cover of a 1996 Super Furry Animals CD single, The Man Don't Give a Fuck, <laughs> which takes its title from the second line of a couplet from Steely Dan's Showbiz Kids, showbiz kids making movies of themselves, you know, they don't give a fuck about anybody else. Not only takes its title from, but samples and repeats that line 50 times in the course of its four minutes, 47 seconds, making it, for a time, the sweariest record ever released. Uh, it's no longer the world's sweariest. Uh, that record is now held by a live version of the same song. Recorded in 2004, which comes in at 23 and a half minutes and therefore contains a fuckload more fucks. <laughs> On the sleeve of the studio version, the goalkeeper has been cropped out of the photograph so that all you're left with is Robin Friday looking in truth like he doesn't give much of a fuck about anything. Although Robin Friday himself isn't the man referred to in the song's title. The man of the title is the counterculture man, or in the words of Super Furry Animals lead singer and lyricist Griff Reese, any organization that is terrorizing you or anyone who's cramping your style. Or as my colleague at the Seamus Heaney Center, the poet Leontia Flynn says, she always thinks when she hears a mysterious they being invoked, the people in capes. And Robin Friday is giving him, giving them, as in fact, in that far off day against Luton Town, he gave Milia Alexic the fingers. Earlier this summer, my screenwriting partner and I 
this summer? This is this summer, earlier this autumn. I just completely misread. This is wishful thinking on a rainy day in Belfast. Earlier this autumn, my screenwriting partner and I, Colin Carberry, adapted our 2012 film, Good Vibrations, for stage at the Lyric Theatre here in Belfast. Good Vibrations is the story of Terry Hooley, whose father had repeatedly stood for election, unsuccessfully, on a non-sectarian Labour ticket, and who at the age of 29, in the late 1970s, that's Terry was 29, not his dad, in the late 1970s, opened a record shop on what was then the most bombed half mile in all of Europe. A record shop that became a haven for a generation of young people from all quarters of the city, and in time spawned a record label that released the undertones Teenage Kicks. There are a great many stories about Terry Hooley, most of which he has told himself. But just to give you a flavour of the man, here's a story I heard from someone else at an evening celebrating the history of protest song at the Oh Yes yeah Centre on Gordon Street. A couple of years before the start of our troubles, so sometime in the mid-1960s, there was a demonstration. The guy I was talking to thought probably against the Vietnam War down Royal Avenue, our main shopping street. Just as it was setting off, this guy looked over his shoulder and he saw Terry and his placard heading in the opposite direction on his own. Terry, he shouted, where are you going? And Terry shouted back, I'm forming a splinter group. <laughs> Which is funny, what I thought was funny. And typical Terry, but the real point of the story for me was what the man said to me next. He said, do you know what? we would all have done better to follow him. Many of the people in Terry's circle back then ended up drawn into the conflict, taking sides, taking up guns. He himself escaped an attempt on his life by people he knew, and he was severely beaten on more than one occasion for his refusal to take sides himself. The rest of the time, he was, as is often the lot of nonconformists and dissenters, dismissed as a joke. A clown. There's a key scene in our good vibrations just after the shop has opened, in which the crowd at a punk gig on which Terry has just stumbled chased the police. Actually, Brian Young was playing that gig. Brian, who was here earlier on, um, was playing at it. He may have mentioned it. Terry's just stumbled on this crowd, and they chased the police from the pound bar, which is about 200 yards from where we gathered this afternoon, chased them out with chants and jeers. I noticed in rehearsals for the stage production that the young cast all held up their middle fingers to wave goodbye to the cops. I had to point out to them that this was the 1970s. A single finger in Belfast was as exotic as an aubergine. <laughs> it was two fingers, always two fingers. Stiff Little Fingers, one of the more overtly political Belfast bands at the time who recorded the seminal Alternative Ulster, even incorporated a stylized version of the fingers in their logo. You could probably find it on display in the permanent exhibition of music from Northern Ireland down at Oh Yeah, or possibly even up in the Troubles and Beyond room at the Ulster Museum. Although, if you ask me, the logo is, well, a little too stiff, because you didn't just raise your fingers, you threw them. Bend it, stretch it, double it, send it. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought it from the way I did it, but there's such energy in that. <laughs> energy mixed with insouciance, even glee. TV news cameras in those days, and in those days there were TV news cameras aplenty in Northern Ireland, were two-finger magnets. Teenage girls and boys would jostle to register their disdain. Was it disdain? Their disdain. For whoever was on the other side of the screen looking back at them. And also, to an extent, their disdain for the events that had brought the cameras there in the first place. I would call it a non-verbal form of dissent, were it not for the fact that it was often accompanied by three single-syllable words, equally gleefully delivered up your hole. <laughs> so, not non-verbal, but not necessarily structured either. At its most elemental, dissent is about differing in opinion, or even just in sentiment. 
feeling. We each of us at every stage of our lives define ourselves as much by what we descend from as what we adhere to. My daughter told me the other day a friend of hers didn't have a record player. Now, three or four years ago, few people had, but it wasn't that her friend hadn't caught up. She had gone beyond. She's all about cassettes, my daughter said. <laughs> Vinyl has become mainstream again, even a little smug. I'm speaking at a vinyl festival in Dunleary outside Dublin next weekend. I could be pleasantly surprised by the demographic. <laughs> I am the demographic. The simple truth is that dissent can very easily harden into orthodoxy, that self-definition can quickly become self-regard. I think the measure of us all as people is how we behave towards those who dissent from us. Be tenacious by all means in your own dissent, but be dignified in the face of those who dissent from your beliefs. Which sort of brings me, there was no alphabetical way on earth we were going to get from Belfast to Brighton without encountering it to Brexit. Ooh, would be groom. Ooh, ooh. Again, probably several. I see some leaflets down there mentioning Brexit, bridge to Brexit. I just wanted to say, I voted to remain, not because I understand the European Union and all its workings fully, but because I feel the European project is in the best interest of the greatest number. I have to accept, though, that some people feel differently, or at least they did the last time they were asked. Quite a lot of people, actually. That is their right to feel differently. There are obviously twerps and zealots and not so closet xenophobes in their camp, heading it up, in fact. But there are also those who I can see felt themselves to be in a minority and wanted to register their dissent, only to find, perhaps to their surprise, that they were, after all, a majority. Those who had been the majority, meanwhile, found, to their horror, that they were now a minority, though not in Northern Ireland, where the majority voted for what turned out to be the minority cause, including a great many who had grown up identified as a member of a different kind of majority within Northern Ireland itself, that is, though a minority on the island as a whole. <laughs> if you follow me. <laughs> if, in years to come, anyone asks me to describe the experience of these times, I will describe for them a real journey I took. I don't mean like a as opposed to a made-up one, I mean by train, a real, real journey, a real journey I once took from Manchester to Norwich, in which on at least two separate occasions the train pulled into a station facing in one direction and pulled out again facing the other. By the time it reached Thorpe Station in Norwich, my fellow passengers and I were so disoriented the station guards were using cattle prods to steer us up the platform. Well, practically. Orthodoxy, as I had been saying before I hopped onto the train, generates dissent, becomes a new orthodoxy, generates new dissent. Dissent keeps us honest. Dissent reminds us we can go too far, not can, all too frequently do. Political opposition is, in this sense, dissent given institutional form. One of the things that has most irked me about the political dispensation in Northern Ireland in the wake of the Good Friday Agreement, which I also voted for 20 years ago in April just past, one of the things that has most irked me about it is that it made no provision for an official opposition. If citizens here hadn't known it already, the current inquiry into the Renewable Heating Initiative scandal, aka cash for ash, has revealed that our vaunted power-sharing executive is no more than a hollow shell of the long dreamt of union of Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter. It has been, for much of, it, most of its lifetime, a duopoly, a carve-up by two parties whose loathing for each other is only outweighed by their reluctance to relinquish control to anyone else. 
We did finally get a mechanism for an opposition in March 2016, although that has not yet come into effect, given that it requires a change to the standing orders of the Northern Ireland Assembly, which has itself not sat since the start of 2017. So still no opposition, and now, for the best part of two years, no fucking government. I was talking earlier about good vibrations. The film version of the story ends in the Ulster Hall, 24th of April, 1980. At the time, the largest venue in Belfast. For a gig that is supposed to be a fundraiser for the shop which is in dire financial difficulties. Except Terry Hooley lets half the audience of punk kids in free. Because Belfast at that moment is in the midst of a particularly nasty spasm of violence. After a brief period in which it seemed as though things might be opening up, people are being dragged back behind their lines. Better to have this one glorious night, is Terry's reasoning, than to simply carry on until the next crisis. He rounds off the night at the microphone himself, singing a song, a hymn almost, to all those who, like himself, has been dismissed as jokes and clowns, reclaiming the terms. The song is Laugh at Me by Sonny Bono. So I don't care, laugh at me. If that's the fare I have to pay to be free, then baby, laugh at me. The play ends with the same song, but whereas in the film, Terry simply says he and the band are going to do an old Sonny Bono song because they fucking can, now he prefaces it by saying, they call us jokes, clowns, well fucking let them. And while he sings, by a feat of theatrical leisure demand, the scene changes and the audience is fast forwarded with him from 1980 to 2018. Now, I can say this without blushing because it was not my doing or Colin Carberry's. It was entirely the director's, Des Kennedy's. But the audience were on their feet and cheering every single night the moment Laugh At Me finished. Or the moment Aaron McCusker, who was playing Terry, finished with the song. On more than one occasion, they were on their feet long before that. I appreciate there might have been a very specific Northern Irish explanation for this reaction. For reasons just outlined, there is a huge amount of frustration with our disassembled state. But I think something more was going on, something more even than the general dissatisfaction with organized politics abroad in the world. Griff Rees of the Super Fairy Animals said at the time of its release, the man don't give a fuck could bring down the government right now, but in five years time, we could be ruled by pilots from Venus, and then they'd be the man. Or here is an even more frightening thought. We ourselves in time become the man, or woman, the establishment, the people in capes. As a human being, I am a mass of contradictions. I struggle for consistency, struggle to do what is right, live how is right, and I fall short a hundred times a day, and a hundred times more worry that my life has become, as it were, a mere museum of my past life, built on equivocation and compromise, to which all I do is add new artifacts and trinkets. I may be extrapolating wildly here, but I think that what was happening in that laugh at me moment at the Lyric Theatre was that members of the audience were connecting or reconnecting with an inner scene of dissent present in us all. Belfast has changed exponentially in the last 38 years, but the character represented on the stage like the man on whom he is based stands at the same critical angle to his world, this city, in 2018, exactly as he did in 1980. He is still calling out the shortcomings. And of all those who would ridicule or belittle or otherwise try to marginalize him, he says the same thing now as then. Fucking let them. It is, as I say, a defiantly dissenting voice. And even though it could have got you sent off in the 1970s, could get you sent off still, and is certainly not one which Mary Ann McCracken would have approved of, it is to me a profoundly decent voice as decent, in fact, 
as up your hole. <laughs> Which, even so, something tells me, might not be quite the words to go out on. <laughs> so, there being no actual torch to hand on to Brighton, my last act before quitting this bendy bus of an address is to the team there this message for next year. Bend it. <laughs> Stretch it. Double it. it. Peace. Thank you, Glenn, for an extraordinary bendy bus of a journey from the McCrackens through to George Best, vinyl, stiff little fingers, giving us all the finger, reminding us of teenagers and their resistance um, and of that seam of descent that we can find in all of us if we give it a chance and give ourselves a chance. That was a really... It was a great way to end uh, to, for our, our final keynote. Um, to, to sum up a lot of the things we've been discussing actually over the last couple of days, it's extraordinary the, num the way you pulled so many things together. Um, I was glad though when you looked up and saw Glenn Patterson writer and kind of pondered that for a minute, your eye didn't drop because the text along there said, you dick, quite clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably say that to yourself enough. <laughs> uh, so now it's my pleasure to uh, invite the return of our three dissenters who opened this uh, conference yesterday morning uh, for their reflections on what they've heard in the last two days. So I'd like to welcome Elaine Humangurian, Paddy Gilmore, and Sarah Wajid to the stage. You, you know, the obvious thing to say is that that's a hard act to follow. But in fact, it's a revelatory act to follow, at least for me, coming from the United States. Because when I reflect on these two days, uh, one of the things I reflect on is the ability of so many of you to use words to suggest poetry and, and conflict and lack of resolution and multiple perspectives all at the same time. And we've just witnessed in the hands of a glorious writer exactly that. And I found myself thinking through all of it, oh, I wish we knew how to do that in museums. And that's, I, I thought, what I was going to talk about, which was we don't yet have the tools to do what I'm hoping we are struggling with, which is conflict, lack of resolution, poetry, the humanity, the ability to both love someone and make fun of them, the ability to, of the human condition to kill each other and to either feel remorse or not. Um, so thank you for doing what you just did. And I walk away thinking I'm going home to double my efforts to try and figure out how we get the tools to do what we were just in the presence of, because it's in fact the outcome we want, though we have a different material to do it with. 
And I suspect we can find it, though it's taken me 50 years and I haven't found it yet. So maybe I'll go home and be a poet instead or an essayist. Um, let me try and figure out the kinds of things that I heard and the kinds of things I'm troubled with. Um, I'm struck in this city, but struck in my own country with the man's evidence of man's inhumanity to man or humans in humanity to humans and their exquisite perfection of doing more horrible things than the last people did. And I've been struck for the last two days about, here I am at a very brave conference in a city healing itself. And I'm not at all sure. I've spent a lifetime building museums of bad news for people quite certain that they wanted their stories told. And about the last time I was in Ireland, which I think is a decade ago, I was in Derry. And it was at that moment where I was both at the Bloody Sunday Museum and the Orange Men Museum, and it was a hundred yards away from each other that I thought maybe I wanted to rethink my career. Because I'm not sure why we do museums of bad news. We certainly can't comfort ourselves in thinking that they help. Um, we can comfort ourselves that the victims get a chance to make present their victimhood and that they're not forgotten. But I want museums to be a force for peace and I'm not at all sure that museums of bad news are forces for peace, especially when they reveal our capacity to do unspeakable things to each other. And I walked in with that worry and I walk out with that worry, but I know that I'm in the presence of people who are incredibly thoughtful, very careful about thinking this through, very brave, wanting to be candid. And the last session I was just at was the session about the Troubles exhibition and beyond. And one of the things I think are in our quiver they are playing with, and that is multiple opinions and unresolved information. And I asked them how difficult it was, and it turned out they said, we always intended to do that. And Brian Young said, who was amazingly articulate about the value of punk in the ability to bring peace or at least relief, um, he said, people could see the humanity of each other, and I think that's a step before f forgiveness. I don't think there's ever forgiveness, but I think there is in the recognition of the humanity of each other that we all share this very flawed human condition. Um, I usually start by saying I want what every Miss America says she wants, which is world peace. It's the closest I ever get to Miss America. <laughs> but I think she, whoever she is, is right. I mean, we all want world peace, and I want museums to be an instrument of world peace. And so I'm currently come to the mo notion that it's not in the content, that it's in seeing each other, that it's in understanding that a space where strangers safely meet Perhaps they will walk out and think one less horrible thought about each other than they thought before they came in. And that the reason for inclusion is so that all strangers can see all strangers. And I wrote a paper called Strangers Safely Meet in which I studied what the police think about this. And in fact, the police want spaces where they are occupied 24 hours a day by strangers because it lowers the crime rate. And I thought maybe we want to participate in that, that 
the more public space we have, the more strangers can sit and watch each other, the more they can take the chance of walking in that they'll walk out and not be killed, maybe we're aiding world peace. And that's as far as I've gotten. And I'm not sure that I get a lot of time to go any further, but I'm really not at all sure. At some point during the next, last two days, I thought, in some ways, what museums are doing is allowing us to live two lives, the life I'm really living, and then the life you're going to report on by unearthing all my artifacts and then reproducing them so that I get to live in absentia, my life in real time all over again. And I'm not certain that I want more than one of these. So I'm walking away a little confused again. I want to read you. The other thing I wanted to say was that I think we have an inflated idea of heroism. And I don't think losing one's job because one stood up for principles without exploring all the subtle ways we could have ameliorated this and have it still come out right should be a, a destination we look forward to. I, I, want, I want to proclaim the virtues of under the radar of small steps, of helping each other, of... And, and the metaphor I used for myself and I said to somebody is, you know, in Anne Frank was hidden, and if the woman who hid her wanted to proclaim her heroism, she and Anne Frank would be immediately dead. That there's a certain, we should, at least pay some attention to subtlety and silence as a dissenting tool. And we should pay attention to small acts where we learn the political skills that the politicians know, especially the politicians that we don't like, so that we can best them at their own game is worth it for us. So I want to speak up for small steps and under the radar and silence and resistance that has no placard. And, and I want to thank all the people in their work who stand up in a way that is so subtle that everybody changes their behavior but doesn't get angry at the perpetrator. Um, when I was younger, I was very good friends with then the most famous museum director, a um, museum educator. Her name was Bonnie Pittman. She, she was the head of Excellence and Equity. And we sat together, I'm looking at two people in the front row at a conference, and she held up a sign. She was very elegantly dressed and had very good manners. She held up a sign for the speaker and it said, boring. And she put it down and they blamed me. <laughs> because I was much too noisy and had no good manners at all, and so I must have done it. I'm, I've studied Bonnie Pittman ever since, and I suggest you do that. So I'm not for in-your-face exhibitions, because in-your-face exhibitions are exhibitions of the good guys and the bad guys. Only the good guys go to them, or the good victims, or the, and the bad guys don't, but the problem is the bad guys also live in your country, and it doesn't lead to reconciliation or healing. And in fact, I think this troubles exhibition, where it's unresolved and you're left with the humanity of people who each thought they were right, is a much more effective tool. The effectiveness of this resistance is not to be found in its size, though large, or my, right, or my perceived rightness in its cause. What interests me is the following. This is the resistance in my country. This resistance has proved to be everywhere with a vast frontier about a myriad of issues, large and small, 
Rather than being centrally organized, unified, and strategic, it is episodic, non-hierarchical, seemingly uncoordinated, and often useful in gaining support and changing behavior on the topics it focuses on. No one needs to agree or to participate on all issues. Instead, there is some group that is doing something that excites someone there's no single leader, no one problem, no lasting disparagement about the importance of or seeming superficiality of one problem picked over the other. The resistance groups cohere when it suits them, but it's not regimented. Given the cacophony of placards seen at every demonstration, the members of these specifically focused resistance groups seem to delight in their participation with everyone in the Do Everything movement. So I thank you for inviting me. I thank you for your bravery and for your dedication to making the world a better place. I hope you will do small things and do everything. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, for me, this is a classic case of having drawn the short straw. Glenn Patterson, followed by Elaine Human Green. What am I going to say here? How am I going to follow that? I'm just totally. I mean, I think one of the things I'm really interested in was the fact that last year we finished off the conference by talking about Belfast. Come to Belfast, you're going to love it. It's a great city, it's a gritty place. We do a lot of good things, we're good people. And I think, sort of, uh, I think we've proved that over this last couple of days. I think it has worked out. I'm delighted you've come here. And I think, you know, and, uh, you've heard a lot of our stories and about, you know, how we handle our conflict and so on. But we're more than that. We're defined by not the conflict, by all the things that are good in Irish life. We've shared this conference with the Irish Museums Association, and it's been an absolute joy to hear of the work that's happening length and breadth of Ireland and the length and breadth of the UK. So for me, I think it has worked out, and uh, I've just a few sort of thoughts. Very much uh, like Elaine, um, I, I, I mentioned uh, yesterday about the sort of the power of small steps. I think that's the key to it. Very few of us here are in positions of power. Very few of us here are in a position to influence things and make things happen, where most of us are not directors of big museums, and it's the small steps that make the difference. We had a really great um, session where we uh, talked about actually some of the work we do, and I'm going to have to blow it up because why wouldn't I, you know? But we talked about some of the work that's happening with national museums, and we work uh, over a period of time with people from nationalist communities and from, from loyalist communities. We shared the resources of the museum with them. These people are very much below the radar. They're based in local communities. They're struggling with really, really minimal resources. And I feel as an organization, we really have to sort of share the resources we have. We're big, you know, we can do these sort of things. But that's the sort of stuff that makes a difference. And the key thing that struck me from, from one of the guys, it doesn't really matter which side he came from, but what he said to me was, my community was not represented in your museum. The Ulster Museum was, wasn't for someone like me. And then you started to talk to us, and then you started to engage with us. And that has made a difference. And one of the things that struck me, and, and, and Elaine, you said that sort of that be prepared to be sacked, is that right, yeah? So here we go. I, I think I'm out of here from Monday. Uh, <laughs> do you know what, actually, I mean, when I listened to directors in conversation this morning, I just wondered, have they, in many ways, picked up the radical vibe that was around? Um, I think that sort of that there was a lot of talk about our museum. I didn't hear too many of them saying our community. And I think that sort of struck with me. I think it struck a chord there, like, you know. And it's the stuff that we're doing in the communities in many ways outside the museums is the important stuff. So that's my act of dissent, and um, I'll pick up my P45 on the way out. Uh, I think grassroots activity is very much at the heart of learning. Uh, sorry, grassroots activity is very much at, at the heart of what we do. And, and someone made the point that sort of that a lot of the activism has been left to education. It's been left to the sort of the people who do the community outreach and so on. Well, do you know what, actually, the four people who sat here this morning are well, the people who can make the difference. They're the people in positions of power, and we're the people who are trying to make the case. So, another act of dissent, I think. Uh, there was a great, there was a, 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 in fact, and I have to say, not to be too hard to the directors, there was a, a really great thing about the protest lab, about having those 30 different voices heard 
And I suppose one of the questions come out of that, which has really has come up in three or four sessions I've been to, how do we actually deal with different perspectives? We've got our own perspective. Someone said it tends to be quite left-wing and quite liberal and all that sort of stuff. How do we deal with the people who don't agree with us, who don't think that you know, what we do is a great thing and so on? And I think Glenn said it. We do it with dignity. We may not necessarily agree with what they say, but we have the dignity and the grace to be able to sort of accept that. Elaine talked about the humanity of that, and that's the basis of it, I think. Um, I think there was another couple of fantastic bits that sort of that, you know, I'd, I'd picked up. Uh, Amber Eagle in his, uh, his speech talked about, we don't disregard elegance. He was talking about really good museums, but neither will we comply with strict good manners. Uh, and I thought that was absolutely great. There was a real resonance in, in that there. And Sharon then talked about sort of like, you know, the activism that we should be involved with. And she talked about sort of the communities we're involved in. And she said that sort of like in the Republic, I'm talking about homelessness, people are slipping through the holes in a non-existent safety net. That's the sort of stuff we, we need to be involved with. And I have to say without sort of uh, wishing to sound too patronizing, uh, I have to say that Elaine's uh, talk in terms of the, uh, in terms of the sort of the, 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 uh, the guidelines she gave us uh, is absolutely amazing. It, it sounded to me that uh, you were giving us a sort of manifesto for, for museum life and how we should behave, and it was totally and absolutely inspirational. It struck me that uh, you've all heard that song, um, you know, sort of like the Baz Luhrmann song, Ladies and Gentlemen of the Class of 97, Wear Sunscreen. It was like that, you know, and, and, and what I've been sussing out is whether or not that has been published, because if it's not published, I'll make you a proposition. What we'll do is we'll record it, you know? <laughs> it's a manifesto for the museums, and it's something to sort of... <laughs> it's so, something good to do, but something I can potentially make money out of as well. So, so, so uh, I have to say, Elaine, you know, I mean, thank you for sharing that advice with us. You know, it was, it was sage advice, it was wonderful, it was genuine, it was heartfelt, and for me, it was one of the most moving bits of the conference. Thank you. I'll, I'll keep it short because I'm standing between you and your, your bad museum wine. Uh, it's been a long couple of days and um, it, it's been a really interesting couple of days. Um, I've, I'm loving Belfast, I'm sure the rest of you are. I uh, must confess I've nipped out occasionally with my local pal Jenny Stewart to sample the delights of Belfast and um, I'll be back soon. Um, but on to the question of dissent and, and the conference and, and sort of what I've taken. I was really struck this morning in the director's session um, by uh, the, I was really sort of heartened by the progressive values embodied by the uh, four directors who were speaking um, and slightly surprised, I suppose, by the level of consensus between them. Um, I was very uh, uh, heartened to hear Hilary uh, McGrady talk uh, with pride uh, and celebrate uh, the strong union in her museum. Uh, and just as we were coming towards the end of that session, I was kind of thinking, well, everything's it's all good. It's all sort of consensual. We're all going in the right direction. These are our progressive female leaders of the future. Um, and uh, But something was slightly missing in the conversation. And at that moment, um, Clara Pallard uh, piped up with a question about privatization of uh, the sector. I don't know if many of you were in that session, um, but that was a really killer question. It was a really important question, really. Um, and the, the comments that came back were broadly... Um, broadly neoliberal solutions really to the question of privatizing uh, catering security and other arms of the museum sector and I thought bang there you are you know actually that's where we are as a sector that um, we we really have to kind of grasp this nettle and actually we're at a slightly dangerous moment it strikes me that um, on the one hand there's this very broad consensus around progressive practice uh, participatory practice moving forward yes we have strong unions but when you get right down to it there are some very hard questions that we have to face at the moment as a sector particularly facing our business models and the cuts that we're facing and the solutions to those cuts and what the impact is on the way that we employ people and how we go forward and actually the old you know it was it was just remarkable to me that it was the old fashioned it was the unionist in the room who asked that very important question and it fell to the unionist and that is that is a very old fashioned model of, of, of that is a very old tried and tested sort of um, 
you know, model of social justice. Where do we look to for kind of solidarity and questions and, you know, holding power to account? It's two unions. And that is actually um, a very, you know, that's not a new thing. That's not participatory practice. That's not 21st century. And there, I felt there was a lot of that going on in the last couple of days, that there are some there are some, we, have, we need to know our own history as a sector, actually, and we need to um, listen. When It was interesting when Ian Blatchford was talking about, um, read, re, re, he said, read uh, Renaissance in the Region Report, 2001, and somebody in the Decolonizing Museum session said, read the Mayor's Commission for African Asian Heritage. We have been here before, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. We have the answers. So a lot of the answers are actually already within very tried and tested, proven practice. And what I kind of felt was that, yes, there's, there's dissent, and yes, there's amazing things happening. I love museum as muck. Don't know if any of you visited the Supermuckers booth, but that was my absolute highlight of the, um, the conference. Um, so brilliant new things coming through. But actually, uh, when it gets right down to it, there's this little um, model uh, the, for coaching. If you know the acronym GOAL, goal um, you know, uh, identify your goals, look at your, uh, what is it, reality, grow. Identify your goals, uh, understand your reality, look at your options, and then grasp the will. The will is the important bit. The W is the do it. Get out and do it, and actually grasp the nettle. And I think that's where we're at as a sector, is we've got the G, we've got the R, we've got the O. It's time for W. We need the will. We need to actually make this stick. Um, and that's kind of the that's what I felt in the room these last couple of days. Um, enjoy your bad museum wine. Thank you for really thought-provoking. Every time I think I must be uh, thought it out. I've, I've had so many things to think about. Um, little seeds are planted and ideas brought forward and it's been a really worthwhile um, conference from that point of view. Uh, I'd now like you to welcome to the stage Sharon Heal, um, the Museum's Association Director. Thank you, Roisin, and thank all of you, our delegates, to the conference over the last two days. I just want to briefly mention a couple of things. I thought about the adjectives or words we might use to describe this conference. Challenging, dissenting, incisive, troubling, fun, and a little bit sexy. Not a word you would normally associate with a Museums Association conference. I hope. <laughs> I started by saying it's 30 years, three decades, <laughs> since, since the Museums Association Conference has been in Belfast, and that we didn't have the internet then and social media. But Twitter is a really good record of this conference. There's been some amazing tweets put onto the record there. So we've had three things. We've had some dissent. We've had our marvelous dissenters in conversation and Laura Rykovich from the Queen's Museum and Space Invaders talking about a woman's place being in the leadership of a museum and Rita Ann Higgins and Glenn Patterson weaving wonderful words to describe our journey and the journey of this city and the journey of Northern Ireland and the journey of this island. We've had some wise words and a lot of them have come from Elaine Gurian, which has been my honor to meet her and speak with her over the course of the last couple of days. Her Do Everything manifesto, which Paddy referred to, has been captured by me and will be tweeted, so your money-making opportunity is perhaps gone, Paddy. But one of her points on the manifesto was, Optim optimism is your most important asset. Have a great time whenever possible. And we've also had some fun. So when I came to Belfast in 2012, I was invited by Visit Belfast to look at all the great venues that we might bring to the conference too. And one of them was City Hall, where we had our reception on Wednesday evening. And when I was there in 2012, I met the mayor of Belfast, who was a Sinn Féin mayor, but that wasn't the surprising thing about him. The surprising thing was he was 21 years old. 
He was a 21-year-old mayor of this city. And I thought then, I think we can do business here. I think we can do something really interesting with this city and our conference. And we have, and we'd had lots of fun and dissent along the way. Who could forget the Vagina Museum, the museum as muck, and the drag queens at Ulster Museum last night? It was amazing. This year, it's been Belfast. Next year, it's Brighton. We opened with the words of Count George Plunkett, an active participant in the Easter Rising and a past president of the Museums Association. I want to close with the words of the Mayor of Brighton when he spoke in 1873 at the opening of Brighton Museum and Gallery. He said, inspire the minds and morals of the people. Forget the busy world and afford pleasure and consolation from illness or depression. That was insightful then, but we can't forget the busy world because we are part of it. The theme of next year in Brighton is sustainability and ethical museums in a globalized world. Belfast, it's been a blast. Brighton, here we come. This is my, my final task. I see you're all hurrying for the coaches. Um, I don't think the wine's that bad, actually, looking at the, the stampede out of the room. Um, it's been great. It's been a real privilege um, to be part of this and a real honor um, to have uh, compared it. Um, I suppose I'll end, I think, with the words of a local trade unionist and activist, Innes McCormick. And one of her guiding principles was, look around the room and see who isn't in it and use your power to bring them into the room. And it seems to me that that's been very much the, the spirit of this conference. It's about looking around to see who isn't there. And it's also about looking at the comfort or discomfort of those who are sitting in the room. It's looking at power and authority and hierarchies. And Sharon mentioned the, um, the Museum as Muck exhibition, which was just wonderful. And there was one little testimony in it, a short testimony from someone talking about class, being working class in the museum sector. And they said, when people ask to see a curator and I say, that's me, I see the disappointment on their faces because I have an estuary accent and I am not a man. And there was something about that that was very moving, I thought, the kind of, that sense of, um, of, of not being enough, that people who come into the world without enough carry with them. And I think that that was also something that, that many of the panels tried to address. What, not just as a museum, but as a work environment. What can different organizations do to address that? And I thought that I, I was at one of the sessions on uh, the age of activism, and it really struck me that one of the things um, to take away is that we all have to increase our tolerance for, um, for discomfort, for uncertainty, for um, an awareness that we are not the experts on everything. So bringing in other types of expertise and experience, and above all, being open to our own insecurities, failures, and potential. And I think there, is, there were hard questions asked at this conference, but there was also in those questions the possibility that some things are changing and that more things will change and that there is agency within the sector but also within it with individuals and I'll end with the words of the woman who opened the conference for us um, and clearly ha has had a huge impact on all of our thinking throughout the last couple of days Elaine uh, Human Gurian who had 
uh, an unfortunate beginning in her hotel room in Belfast and was told by reception, only you can reset. Um, only we as individuals, we, we have to take the responsibility and proceed and reset. So thank you very much. Um, oh, thank you. Can I ask, are any of the organizers still in the room or are they all in the coaches to HMS Caroline? So can I ask you to give a round of applause and I'm going to insist that if any of them are here, they stand up, including Simon. It has been a really wonderful conference, brilliantly organized. Thank you very, very much. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Those two cards to do is the last session, master, and then we've got probably we'll have three of those cards to do as well. Nice. And plus whatever you need to do on yours. I've only got one of those now. There is. That's a backup. It's two hours of backup. Yeah. Um, is there any way we can double up on the Sony? Can we, can we run, out, run out of the Sony camera? It's only USB 2, um, so I can't grab another the laptop. I'm only going to take, well, I'll take two hours doing this on my laptop. So perhaps. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll see when we we'll get on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my laptop. Yeah, I can time. always do. This one's not up till late, that's all I'm thinking. Huh? This one's not having got to be up till late, that's all I'm thinking. I'm just aware that it's, it's, it's so late, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can. I can set one of these cards away onto one format here while we're packing away. It's just a laptop, isn't it? Laptop, so we can pack, we can pack a, a way around it, can't we? I'll do this when I get when we get back. Cause it's, I'll take an hour. Yeah. No, I'll leave it till we get back. I think. Well, I think we'll just de-rig. <laughs> 